Well, hey, Journey Church, good morning. Welcome to our virtual service. We are so glad that you have joined us today. And I'm really excited to be coming to you today from uh, the offices of New Culture Church. Uh, Just one of the values we have at the Journey is really partnering with churches and ministries in our city. And New Culture Church has been around for years. Uh, They are reaching young adults. They are loving the city. And we are just so excited that they let us use their space to film today. So all you're seeing here is just the corner of the awesome space that they have, uh, but I wanted to just give them a shout out because uh, we are all just so thankful for the churches that have partnered with us from Gateway to High Point to Heartland and now to New Culture. Uh, We believe that uh, where there's unity, the Lord commands a blessing, and so uh, we are excited to be experiencing that blessing and be sharing that with uh, New Culture Church. Uh, Some things to keep in mind. Number one, my name is Stephen Mulkey. I'm the lead pastor here at The Journey. So glad you've joined us. Number two, uh, have a Bible and a journal with you for this service. We want to experience the power and the presence of God as we meet together virtually. So have your Bible, have your journal ready because the Lord's going to speak to you as we experience service today. Uh, Number three, go to journeymadison.com to the watch live page, fill out the connect card. So that way we can get in contact with you. We can get you connected to community. We recognize that it takes time to build trust, to even show up in person. And so before you meet us in person at the Goodman Center, we'd love to know that you're watching online. We'd love to reach out to you. We can do uh, Zoom meetings or FaceTime meetings um, until you're comfortable to me in person. And this uh, post-COVID world, right, we're all getting comfortable being together, and we'd love to meet you and get you connected. Well, we're going to sing a couple songs together, so join me in prayer, and then we'll sing. Jesus, thank you for this time where we can be together, we can sing, we can celebrate, we can hear the word. God, we pray you would move in powerful ways right now as we know uh, wherever anyone's at as they're watching this, Lord, you want to meet them there with your power and your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. Hey, InterVarsity. My name is Julia, and I'm here with my friends Colin and Andy, and we're just going to enter into a time of worship together. I love how in the Bible, in Second Chronicles, it talks about how they actually had musicians and singers and worshipers go before the army as they entered into battle. And the songs they were singing weren't about their current situation. They weren't songs that were asking God for help, even though that would have been appropriate. Instead, they sang, give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. They declared who God was and they expressed gratitude for it. And they saw victory. Let that be our stance today as we enter into worship. As we declare who God is, let us also be facing those things that seem to be attacking us, be it anxiety, fear, doubt, loneliness, isolation, and illness. And instead, let's just worship God and declare who He is because we know that we already have victory in Him. So let's enter into this time together and just declare that God is good, faithful, all-powerful, and sovereign. Our God, a firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground, as nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken, we trust forever in. Jesus, you are the only king forever, almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore, you are victorious, you are the only king forever, almighty God, we lift you higher, you are the only king forever, forevermore. 
You are victorious. Oh. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice, you will reign, and every knee will bow. Our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, the name of Jesus. Oh, oh, we trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. trust in your name we proclaim your name we lift our banner high we lift the name of Jesus from age to age to age your kingdom has no end we lift our banner high we lift the name of Jesus from age to age to age, your kingdom has no end. Cause you are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only king forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Quaked before, moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are. Thy 
disappeared from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea
back in the morning. Who makes the orphan a son and a daughter? It's the king. He's the king. Well, church, uh, we get the opportunity every time that we gather, either virtually or in person, uh, to receive an offering. And again, I want to say thank you to all of you who generously give uh, every week, week in and week out. Your uh, recurring giver, your tithing, thank you. Uh, those dollars help fund our staffing, help fund our uh, the rental of the Goodman Center, our ministries to Laundry Love and other places throughout our city. Uh, so thank you for giving. I encourage you, if you're new to the journey or you're new to even giving, uh, you don't necessarily have to start with tithing, but you want to start somewhere. As Jesus has said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So uh, I just encourage you to give. I am thankful for all of you who are giving consistently and faithfully. Uh, Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for your generosity to us, Lord. And as we as we give right now, Lord, we pray that we would uh, experience your blessing in our lives as we give, as we say, Jesus, you are the most valuable thing in our life, not money. So thank you, Jesus. Amen.
Hey everybody, I'm Jill Bailey. Welcome to The Journey, and thanks so much for being here with us today. We're going to get started with our sermon in just a minute, so please take a moment to get your Bible and journal ready. If you're new here with us at The Journey this morning, we want you to feel at home. So no matter your background or current situation, just know that this is a safe and welcoming place, and we're glad to have you here with us. We also want you to know that there's a place at The Journey that's just right for you, because church is so much more than just a Sunday service. It would be so helpful to us if you'd be sure to make your way over to our website at journeymadison.com and go on our Watch Life page and fill out our visitor form today. When you click submit, it goes to one of our pastors and you'll get a nice welcome email from Pastor Stephen and a gift from us in the mail. We're so glad to have you here with us today. And church, we have just been loving being in person at our 1030 service on Sundays, every Sunday except for the third Sunday at the Goodman Center. And we look forward to seeing you there. However, if you're still not ready to come back, that's okay, because we're going to continue to roll out wonderful virtual content every day to keep you connected until every single one of us are ready to be back worshiping in person at the 1030 service on Sundays at the Goodman. And as the year of the, the word of the year forward unfolds, we are continuing as a church to move forward into Madison on the third Sunday of every month to get out into the community, to serve and to love on our neighbors. We will not have the in-person services at the Goodman Center at 1030 on the third Sunday of the month, so make sure you mark it down until it becomes muscle memory to move forward into Madison. And services will stream on demand all weekend long, of course. Also remember, Barbecue Sunday at the Mulkies, every Sunday night, 6 to 8. Just show on up. We're here to have fun. It's great for the kids. It's great for the family. Just bring your own meat and a side to share, and we will provide drinks, plates, music fellowship, and fun. If you're new at the journey or a regular attender who wants to be in the know of what's happening, we also have our handy-dandy app. Search for Journey Journey Church Madison on your app store, download the app, and turn on the notifications. It's easy peasy. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our page on Facebook to stay up to date with everything happening at The Journey. Thanks so much for being here with us today. We believe you're here for a reason. God is something that he wants to share and say specifically to you wherever you are. And it's our hope that today you are encouraged and feel closer to him than ever before. Please let us know if we can help you in any way and connect with us at journeymadison.com and on social media to stay up to date with everything happening here at The Journey. Have a great day. Well, church, I am so excited today to introduce to you one of our pastors at The Journey. Her name is Kay Jenin. Now, they've been a part of The Journey for almost a year, and uh, Kay is incredible. Her husband, Chris, is incredible. They have two boys, Gideon and Zion, and we are so grateful for them. They've been a part of our community group. Uh, They are just amazing leaders, and I am so thankful that they chose Uh, to listen to the Lord and come to Madison and that they chose the Journey Church to be a part of because they're incredible leaders. And I know today you are going to be blessed by Kay Jenin, uh, Pastor Kay, as she preaches. Now, we're in our series through the parables, so you're going to want to open up your Bible uh, to the Gospel of Luke, and Pastor Kay is going to be preaching a phenomenal parable about the unfinished tower. So, uh, Pastor Kay, take it away. Thanks, Pastor Stephen. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Pastor Kay Jenin, and I'm so excited to be preaching on a parable with you guys. Um, a parable that's just really spoken to me for a long time is the parable of the unfinished tower, which isn't one that we talk very often about. It's uh, like two verses long, and so that's probably why we haven't heard about it before. Um, but I want to start off sharing a story with you guys. We are currently in the process of buying a house. And um, soon we're going to be 
closing on it. We're going to be painting the whole thing. And um, sometimes <laughs> we start out just wanting to get our house painted, right? Like we just want the interior painted. And then once you start buying paint, you realize it's expensive. And then you realize it takes a long time. At first, you start painting your living room and it seems super fun. And it's like a movie and you have paint on yourselves and it's like you're living the golden days and you're having so much fun. And then after you get through like three rooms, it starts to not be fun anymore. And so last time we owned a house, it took us months and months. My mom had to come in and actually finish it for us. But then she only did one coat, so it wasn't even technically finished. And I kid you not, the day that we finished was like the day before we put our house on the market. Like we finally finished painting our house because we had to. And, and I just, I share that story with you because the unfinished tower is all about counting the costs before you begin, before you start committing to a project. The warning is that you will end up with an unfinished building unless you first assess the cost. So I'm going to read the parable, and then we're going to go from there. So it is in Luke 14. I'm going to read verses 28 through 30. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete the only foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. And then if we skip forward to verse 33, it says, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Man, I love that story. It's short and sweet. Um, and what I want us to take away today is let us be a people who finish what we start and finish it well. And if we're asking ourselves, like, how do we finish what we start? How do we finish it well? Um, Pastor Stephen knows I'm a seven, and finishing what I start isn't my favorite thing to do. Um, I like doing new things and fresh things, and when they get boring, I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> um, but how can we finish what the Lord calls us to do? Like, obedience to the Lord. How do we fulfill that in our lives? We have to count the costs. That whole parable is that we must count the costs of, of what it means to follow Jesus. In verse 33, okay, I'm going to talk about Greek words. I'm going to be that pastor right now. Just because as I was reading it, I felt like the Lord highlighted a word to me that I would go look it up. Um, so the Greek word for own. So it says, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. And so I looked up, what does own mean? It's a word that I'm not going to try to say to you today, but it literally means who and what you are. If you break it down, it translates to what is under your rule or reign. So it's not just material possessions, but it's also who you are. That same word is used in I am or you are um, different, different sentences in the Bible. And so it's literally everything that I have rule over in my life, inside and outside of who I am. Um, and so what it's saying is that our values, our beliefs, our traditions, our hurts, our passions, we cannot become his disciple without giving up all of that. And so as I was asking the Lord, wow, like what does this mean to give up everything we own? Um, he reminded me of Romans 6, 4, where it says, for we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may, may live new lives. The gospel is all about death and rebirth. And I was asking the Lord, what costs are we to consider? There's so many things that the gospel costs us. It's very hard to die and be reborn. So I was asking the Lord, what costs should we consider today? And I felt like he highlighted Galatians 1 and that there was three distinct costs of discipleship. Um, they're not all encompassing, but they are for today. And so I just wanted to walk you through those costs that the Lord highlighted in my heart. The first one is people-pleasing. Um, and when we go into Galatians 1, you'll see it starts with Paul's introduction. He addresses people who are believing false gospels, and he curses people who are preaching false gospels. And then in verse 10, we see that it says, Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. And the Lord just said, that's a cost of being my disciple. The cost of following Christ is that I don't get to win the approval of people anymore. 
Um, in Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. We cannot live for the approval of anyone but God. We can't. That's what the Bible says over and over again. What he says must carry weight in our lives, and we must work to minimize the impact of what others say of us. Um, it looks like two things to me. People pleasing can say, be saying yes when we should say no, and it means agreeing with the lies that people say about you. We need holy boundaries revealed in wisdom to help us understand what to do. That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> um, a couple examples I can give you from my own life is I've said yes to opportunities before out of the fear that those opportunities won't keep coming. I didn't go to the Lord and ask, Lord, what do you have for me to do? I just said yes out of fear of what people would think of me, of what things I, I would be offered in the future, of how that makes me look. And then the other one is I think it's really important for us to look at um, what kind of agreements we make with people when they're speaking to us. I was talking to a pastor that I respected and who was a lot older than me once, and um, she was telling me how I was too young and inexperienced um, to do what I felt like the Lord was calling me to do. And in that moment, I just nodded my head and I was like, yep, I hear you. Instead of saying, actually, I totally respect your opinion, but I'm not going to come into agreement with the fact that I'm too young and too inexperienced. And so I think a lot of times in our life, we try to be friendly and we try not to like hurt anybody's feelings. And we end up coming into agreement with lies that the enemy is saying over us through people. And so just as I've moved on from that and the Lord's taught me through that, I kind of make it my mission that when somebody's saying something that isn't from the Lord for me, that I say, thank you so much that you care about my life, but actually I don't, I don't believe that's for me. Pushing back against lies, that is following Christ. Okay, so number two, the second cost of following Christ is my timeline. My timeline is no longer my own. Um, in Galatians 1, Paul is explaining how the gospel he is preaching is from Christ, and he starts giving a summary of his salvation story. Um, we see in verses 15 through 17, it says, But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. He takes his time. He, um, he says, I did not rush. He recognized his timeline was not his anymore. The whole point of Christ sending the Holy Spirit is that we would be baptized in the Holy Spirit, and then we would have his spirit living in us to listen and heed his voice. There is no black and white answer, which is something I don't like. Um, as I've just grown and experienced things, you really need the Holy Spirit to walk through life. His calling takes time in our life. I don't like it, but over and over again in scripture, we see that his calling took time to pass. Um, we see with Paul, he had a calling to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And we know for a minimum, he took three years before he started walking in that. Um, we see it with David, he was anointed to be the king of Israel. And he was a child, and he had to wait till he was a full adult for that to come to pass. Um, and those are just a couple stories. We see it over and over again. Um, his promises come to pass because he cares more about the process that we're going through than the end result. And he uses that process to do something in us. And we tend to be focused on the end result because we're excited about what the Lord has said, but he's excited about what he gets to do in the process of seeing that come to pass. Um, Paul encountered Jesus and received his calling to preach the good news to the Gentiles. And instead of rushing into that promise, like a lot of us do, right? We hear the Lord and we're like, let's do it. Um, he just leaves. He goes away for at least three years before he comes back to talk to Peter in Jerusalem. We want immediate results, especially in the culture that we live in today. I know people are always saying that, but like literally we have same day shipping from Amazon. <laughs> we have fast food, we have microwaves, we have the whole thing. And our culture is just not the kingdom of God. What we're accustomed to in the world that we live in is just not the kingdom of God. Um, and then the next thing, the final thing that I have for you guys, the third cost 
is our reputation. Um, that one's a hard one. And so in Galatians 1, verses 21 through 24, it says, After that visit, I went north into the provinces of Syria and Cilicia, <laughs> and still the churches in Christ that are in Judea didn't know me personally. All they knew was that people were saying, the one who used to persecute us is now preaching the very faith he tried to destroy. And then they praised God because of me. What I love about that is in the beginning, they're all gossiping about him before he gets there. They're saying like, oh gosh, do you know who this guy is? Like I heard, blah, blah, blah. blah. And then they follow it up with, and they praise God because of me. When God shows up, he kind of restores those things. But the cost of following Christ is that my reputation may be attacked. Paul went into a community that knew him as a terrorist. <laughs> he was killing Christians, and now he was supposedly showing up to preach the gospel. That's super fishy from their end of things. They didn't know him, but Christ knew him. Um, in 1 Samuel, when Samuel is trying to find the next king of Israel to anoint God says to him, don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So we're choosing to follow a God who sees things different than us. It says the Lord looks at the heart. And so people, right, we love judging. We're, we're all judgy. Like we see people and we're like, mm, I don't know about that. And the Lord says that we look on the outside, we look at history, we look at people's past behavior, but the Lord looks at the heart and he knows, he knows, he knows you, he knows me. And just like with Paul, he knew Paul and they didn't know who Paul had become. Um, along with that, we have to surrender to the reality that we will be misunderstood and even attacked. The battle is not flesh and blood, right? It's spiritual, we know that. Um, we come to Jesus, we pray for grace and unity. We wrestle with what it feels like to carry the burden of what people are saying about us. There's tension and discomfort, and we need to seek the Lord to figure out how to do that in a righteous way. And then we find comfort knowing that he's our vindicator, right? God is our defender. We sing that song all the time. And I just wanted to share a story. I was in youth group. I loved Jesus so much. And I had a youth leader start gossiping about me to people. He was like 55 and I was 15. <laughs> and he was gossiping about me. He was telling me to my face that I wasn't a Christian and I wasn't a leader. And I don't know why, but in the moment I didn't I mean, it hurt my feelings, but I didn't take offense to it. I forgave him. And I just moved on and kept doing my thing because I was like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And fast forward to like six years later, right? Not that long. It didn't take that long for the Lord to vindicate me. Um, the next time I saw him, I was a pastor and he had been publicly dismissed from his role in a church for immoral behavior. And so that's not something I ever prayed for. That's not something I wanted to happen. Um, but the Lord sees the heart and he brings things to light that we don't see. And so he does that for our glory, but also for correction as well and to protect people. Um, everything comes to light in his kingdom. And so there's this place that we can rest and not worry that the Lord brings things through a process and he brings things to light in a gentle way. And he's taking care of the things that we're frustrated about or the misunderstandings that we're in. So I want to I wanna just read that short parable back to you about the costs. Um, it says, But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete the only foundation before running out of money. And then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, There's the person who started the building and couldn't afford to finish it. And then verse 33 so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. And so just as we consider the costs of following Jesus, um, something I wanted to say to you guys is you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone will laugh at you, but there is nothing stopping you from picking that up again. Um, that foundation is still sitting there waiting for us to start work again. That's the beauty of serving a gracious God who's for us. 
is he wants us to finish the race, right? He wants us to finish what he started. And there's no, there's no demolition crew that comes in after you. There's nobody that comes in and just destroys what you've been working on because you gave up for a moment. And so I just want us to ask ourselves today, what is, what is the thing that I laid down that the Lord would have me to pick back up again? And what, are, what does the Lord have for me to finish and finish well? Um, and so I just want to pray with you guys that we would ask the Lord to reveal those things to our hearts. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. Um, we thank you that you're the God of second chances and that you let, us, um, you, you let us come back and pick up the things that you've assigned to us, Lord. We want to be people obedient to your calling. We want to be people who finish what we start. And so we, we just ask, Lord, that you would reveal the things to us, the costs that maybe we didn't count yet, that we would count them now. And then we ask, Lord, that you would just give us um, the bravery and um, the courage to pick those things up again and run with them and finish well. God, we thank you. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>